the mainstream studies in science, they all agree that electric vehicles are very good for the environment. I would really encourage everybody to research hydrogen. I think it's the next big thing. But for cars in the coming years, no. Uh, there's a lot of media who really jump at the chance to bring something which they see as fresh and inviting debate and inviting clicks. Uh, uh, which is saying, no, it's all it's all wrong. You see the same in, in the climate debate. Well, this mm. is the edited version. There will be a full uncut version of this interview linked in the description box or find the link up right or up left. I now have the opportunity to talk to Auke Hoekstra, who is a Dutch researcher on battery electric vehicles and renewable energies. And uh, Alke, thank you so much for making this interview possible. I'd like to read out a quote uh, from you that you wrote on yourself on Twitter. I research EVs and renewable energy at the Technical University of Eindhoven. In my spare time, I debunk nonsensical studies on EVs, unquote. So um, with that out of the way, um, there's a article that you have written, a scientific paper labeled top six mistakes. What are they? The, the, the mainstream studies in, 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 in science, they all agree that electric vehicles are very good for the environment. There's, there's lots of professors and, and hundreds of, of PhDs in this, uh, in this field. And if you publish the EV has lower uh, emissions, everybody goes like, duh, we all, all know that. But those studies don't get any publicity anymore because basically you cannot, you cannot really publish on the finding, look, mm. EV is better for the environment because it's not a new finding. Everybody knows this already. Mm. And um, uh, yeah, the media is not interested because it's sort of business as usual. It's not interesting. So don't think that I'm a lone fool <laughs> debunking a couple of institutes. No, I'm actually um, one who sort of repeats why the uh, scientific, I would say in this case, almost consensus is, uh, is, is, is saying something different. Uh, on to my uh, top six of mistakes. Because if once you know those top six mistakes, um, it will be very easy to debunk uh, uh, these studies uh, pretty quickly. The first thing is uh, people overestimate the energy required for manufacturing batteries. Mm -hmm. And often they base themselves on pilot studies that are now 10 year old in, in, in little pilot plants. And, and things have changed dramatically with, uh, with higher, higher volumes. So mm -hmm. for batteries, when you scale them up, emissions go down dramatically. And part of the emissions is mining, but still dramatically. So uh, in my article, which open access, by the way, you can say, you can see what are normal values that you can expect for that. And if the values are much higher, you know something fishy is going on, or you know they haven't done their homework. Second thing is, and that's very easy to recognize, underestimating battery lifetime. Mm -hmm. Many studies say you have to replace the batteries halfway through the lifetime of the car. My good friend Martin Steinbuch has a nice blog with um, uh, hundreds of people recording how quickly the batteries degrade. But, but there you can see that the Tesla Model S battery um, probably will last at least 600,000, maybe even 800,000 kilometers on average uh, before it gets to 80% of range. And you could even argue that buying a Tesla Model S with 80% of range is still a pretty nice deal. So. Right. Since a car is supposed to last for about 250,000 to 300,000 kilometers, the, the batteries will far outlast the car. And the mm -hmm. third mistake is, is assuming an unchanged electricity mix of the lifetime of the battery electric vehicle. And let's assume the electric car drives on that for the next 20 years. <laughs> That's simply not realistic because sure. this mix will change over the coming 20 years, which mm -hmm. means you, if you do a life cycle analysis, which is always what, what we do in this kind of thing, if you, if you, you look over the entire lifetime of the car from start to scrap and mm -hmm. then cycle, and then if you don't take uh, into account that the electricity becomes much cleaner over the time that the car is run, you're making an error. And of course, um, uh, people who, who make these kind of studies that make the EV look bad always look to a country where the mix is bad, so like, like Germany at the moment. In five years' mm -hmm. time, you will have a much harder time, a much harder job painting electric vehicles bad because mm -hmm. the mix will be much cleaner in, in, in Germany in five, in five years. But the average AU mix is already much better. The average AU mix becomes cleaner with nine grams per kilowatt hour on average uh, every year. Uh, fourth error a lot of studies make, um, most actually, is using unrealistic tests for energy use. So basically, they're saying, the, the diesel or the hydrogen, or also the electric vehicle, it uses much less energy per kilometer 
than it really does if a real human being uses it on a real, in my case, mostly European road. Mm -hmm. It has everything to do with in the past that uh, the, the European manufacturers, they try to uh, sort of cheat the, the tests because then uh, the CO2 emitted was less and that meant they were, it was easier to, um, to, to, to reach all the kind of policy targets. So to sum up, basically what you're saying is we shouldn't look at WLTP uh, numbers, but this is what the studies do and this is why the mileage and the gasoline and diesel consumption or hydrogen is unrealistic. Yes, exactly, exactly. Right. Uh, we're now at number five and yes. that is the um, well-to-wheel consumption. Exactly, because uh, everybody understands by now that um, an electric vehicle does emit CO2, um, not at the tailpipe, but because you have to produce the electricity that it runs on. What people forget is that you also have to produce the gasoline or the diesel that the other cars run on. So yeah. everybody is always taking the electricity mix and, and making a quick calculation and say, ah, look, CO2 emissions for the car. And then they compare the CO2 emissions they found in the, in, in the brochure for the diesel or gasoline. Well, the first problem, as I said, is that the brochure is much too optimistic about how much they use per kilometer. So mm -hmm. you have to add easily 40% for that. And then you have to add another 25% or something for the production of the fuel. And for me, the most important mistake, but that's not really a mistake, I sort of smuggled that in to keep it, to give it six. It will be EVs, you can imagine a future system of really low CO2 emissions. Not now, but when we make production low CO2, which we can do, for example, by running factories on solar and, and, and wind. And when we also make the driving a low emission by making driving on, for example, solar and wind, then you have a whole chain and you can get down to from, uh, let's say, 200 to 250 or 300 grams now for gasoline or diesel to, I would say, five gram global, maybe 10 for per kilometer, uh, per kilometer and CO2 emission per kilometer for electric vehicles. That's that's a, a, a really big step change. That's the future mm. we should be working towards. That's the only way we can achieve uh, the Paris uh, the Paris Agreement, for example. So if you know all that, a study saying, well, diesel was actually not that bad. Maybe we should wait with electric vehicles because they're worse for the environment. It's completely nonsensical. If we sum up those percentages at what is the rate that it differs from what the studies portray to be? Well, if you do it like the, the ABAC at ADHC did or like Fraunhofer did, it takes, for example, 200 to 300,000 kilometers before the electric vehicle is cleaner. But if I run the numbers again, it's like 40,000 40, kilometers or something. It's a factor of four in terms of how long it takes before you're better. All right. And most of the scientists agree. I get a lot of emails from, from professors basically saying, we don't have time for this, but great that you do it. And don't forget to, uh, to mention my study, maybe, because we completely agree with you. It needs 40,000 uh, ridden kilometers in a battery electric car to make it on par with a brand new diesel car. And yes. from then on, the electric car will always be uh, cleaner and better for the environment and both the climate. Yes, definitely, right. definitely. Why is it that in the media um, there's repeatedly the same and the same and the same BEVs are worse for the environment, hydrogen is better for the environment? Why does that happen and why does your debunking not hold the same media coverage? Uh, there's a lot of media who really jump at a chance to bring something which they see as fresh and inviting debate and inviting clicks, uh, uh, which is saying, no, it's all it's all wrong. You see the same in, in the climate debate. Mm. I mean, uh, uh, there's a lot of studies pointing out that uh, uh, deniers on average get more coverage per person, a lot more actually, mm. than, uh, than, than, than average scientists even when the average scientist publishes like 10 times more or something. And media loves to get this debate going all the time. First of all, uh, not all those studies are paid for. For example, a lot of those retired professors, I think they're just very stubborn and, and not paid. But so, so I'm not suggesting that everybody who does this is paid. And that the people doing this are, um, um, are not knowingly uh, twisting the truth. As for me, there, there are some people who say, Maybe we should pay you for your debunking. Mm -hmm. And actually, it would be nice to, to be paid 
for debunking. I never get any That's money it. for debunking. So I think the electric vehicle is certainly not the um, uh, uh, cure for all our uh, evils, but it's a big, big, big step forward uh, um, uh, from the, ve the Kessler vehicle. And everybody who tells or tries to prove otherwise um, will get a debug from me. <laughs> like, can the grid support have an, an all BEV fleet? Uh, yes, no problem. The only thing is um, that if all the uh, BEVs start charging um, at peak time uh, uh, in the afternoon, when, when you get home, that's the peak time on the grid usually, mm -hmm. then we have a problem. It means that you charge when the electricity is greenest, but also cheapest. And that also happens to be the moment that the grid is uh, having lots of excess capacity because the grid on average is only used for 20 or 30 percent of its uh, of its uh, uh, total capacity mm. so on average we have about 70 percent of the capacity left uh, electric vehicles are extremely flexible i mean usually they're parked 23 hours out of 24 hours and with the long distance batteries you only need to charge them once a week basically mm. so if you plug them in every evening and for example they get charged in the middle of the night and that's cheaper for you. That's a fine deal. I've never met an experienced EV drive, mm -hmm. which was very much opposed to that idea. Talking about hydrogen, um, do you think there's any hope or future for hydrogen? If so, where and how? There's absolutely a bright future for hydrogen, I think. Uh, I just don't see it in, 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 in personal vehicles. And I actually also don't see it in trucks, but I could be wrong. You know, the, the big problem with hydrogen is not a way to produce energy, it's a way to store energy. You, you lose, let's say, one third or something of the energy when you convert to hydrogen, then you have to uh, put it under pressure, etc., which, which costs you another 10, 15 percent or something. And then you have to burn it again in the fuel cell in the car, which also costs you, let's say, 40 to 50 percent. So um, the, the problem, I think, is that the, the, the business case, I don't see it working for cars. I would like to see it working. I don't have any problem with, with uh, uh, hydrogen because it's almost as good for the environment, I would say, as, uh, as a battery electric vehicles. But it's really, really, really necessary for seasonal storage because uh, for countries up north like the like, uh, Netherlands and Germany, uh, we have long winters with very little solar. For these kind of situations where you want to store multiple weeks or maybe even multiple months worth of energy in some form, batteries are completely unsuitable. On the other hand, for daily fluctuations, batteries are ideal. So for seasonal fluctuations, hydrogen is, I think, one of the front runners to make that happen. Mm. So I would really encourage everybody to research hydrogen. I think it's the next big thing. But for cars and in the coming years, no. Nah. People say, yeah, but people don't want to wait while charging. Mm -hmm. But when you're an experienced EV driver, you know that when you once you have a range of over 350 kilometers or something, you only need fast charging about once a month, once every two months. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's people with other driving patterns, but but for most people, that's really true. Waiting 20 or 30 minutes in the future, 15 minutes uh, once every month is really not such an enormous hassle. That, that, that's not something you, you, you start to use hydrogen for, especially when most people really like to charge at home, for example. See, hydrogen is solving a problem that's simply not there, mm. basically. I'm wondering, for those people watching this uh, video and this interview, um, might be of interest, what can oneself do to have a say in this, in this argument, this fight, if you so want to call it, so what should people do and how also can they can they see that a study is flawed or not? Yeah, um, well, I try to explain it. So uh, it's a bit corny to say follow me on Twitter. <laughs> I think the, the, the energy community on Twitter is actually a very nice and, and usually a friendly community of, of people uh, who know a lot about renewable energy. So, so follow that if, you, if you're interested. I think you have to educate yourself a little bit but what's what? Unfortunately, when you're interested in electric vehicles, it's much simpler than, for example, in climate or something. If you look at those six things that I, that I talked about, for example, sort of my summary, you can take any study that was negative about electric vehicles in the last 20 years apart and say, uh -huh, that. Uh, if you make it a little bit broader, what can I do? Well, making YouTube videos about it could be a very nice idea. <laughs> Certainly, a couple of people will 
learn something new when they watch this. And yeah, that's, that's the way I do it, basically. <laughs> you do the same thing I'm doing in, in, in a way. And overall, I think maybe ask yourself the question, what really makes myself happy? I had this long rant a uh, couple of minutes back in the unedited version <laughs> where I said, why, when did we convince ourselves that having more stuff was a better life? Any psychologist will tell you that it's a delusion. So why not just say, let's find a comfortable home that's not too big and spend a little bit more time on calmly contemplating, researching, working, whatever, whatever mm -hmm. floats your boat. Don't become a slave to more stuff because... I think there's a new generation which is, we're kind of getting bored with this. And if you are part of that group, I think you're making a very, very big difference. I don't think there's a better way to end a very nice and long interview. Auke Hückstraff, thank you so much. Bedankt uh, for the interview and the tight. I hope I pronounced that almost correct. Almost um, correct, yes. So for those watching, thank you for watching. I will try to put all the links down in the description box. As mentioned, there's two videos, the long and the edited version. And if you do like this video, please give it a thumbs up. I wouldn't mind if you subscribe, of course, and thank you for watching.